Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. Welcome back to Karn Academy. My name is Karn and today we're going to be talking about testicular conditions. Now, I don't think these are particularly super high yield, um, especially knowing the tiny unit bits on pathophysiology or epidemiology. But I think the parts that are important to know is having a good list of differentials for testicular masses, testicular swellings, and just testicular pain in general. Um, because that's, I think, what you are more likely to be assessed on picking up which one of these testicular conditions is it, instead of knowing super technical bits about each one of them. So let's start off with some basic anatomy. The testes descend at about 32 to 40 weeks gestation, which means that in any kind of live child, you should be able to palpate the testes. And therefore, if you don't, that represents either um, agenesis of the testes or absence of descent. Now, the testes usually descend within the processus vaginalis, which is the outpouching in the, in the peritoneal cavity. Now, this outpouching usually closes up to form the tunica vaginalis. Now, you can have a situation where this remains open or this pathway through which the testes descended remains open, and that's called a patent tunica vaginalis. And this potential space is dangerous. It's dangerous for a few reasons. One, it can lead to infections and communicating infections because it's an open channel. And two, it can lead to hernias, and in particular, indirect inguinal hernias. We've talked about them in our lecture on hernias previously. Some important structures you need to know. Firstly, the spermatic cord and what are the contents of the spermatic cord? So the vas deferens, the testicular vessels, and lymph nodes. You need to know about the epididymis and then the gubernaculum, which is a fixation point of the testes to the tunica vaginalis and has a really important role in conditions like testicular tor torsion. We will say torture, but that is not a pathology any, anywhere. <laughs> what will we be covering? So today we'll be talking about torsion, uh, infections of the testes or, or the testicular area. So things like epididymis, epididymorchitis or chitis, varicoceles, hydrocele,s and then tumors. So what is testicular torsion? As I mentioned earlier, the testes are fixed to the tunica vaginalis through the gubernaculum. Now, if the fixation does not happen, it leads to testicles being mobile, which means they are free to rotate. And this rotation can often lead to a torsion. This torsion happens around the spermatic cord, and that leads to, obviously, blocking the contents of the spermatic cord. So it means you can't drain the testes anymore, which leads to venous compression. You can also have edema and ischemia. Now, a question in my head always was with kind of these incarcerated pathologies, whether it's a torsion or a strangulated hernia, why do we get edema? Like, why do we get venous compression? Because, well, we are blocking the veins, so you can't drain back, correct. But aren't we also blocking the artery? So technically, we shouldn't drain into the testicle to begin with. That's what I thought. Um, but then it turns out that because the arterial system is a much higher pressure system, you can still have blood going to the testicle, but unable to leave the testicle. And that leads to the compression, the edema, and eventually you're going to have a, vas a, a compromised vascular supply leading to ischemia. Now, one of the most important risk factors for testicular torsion is something called a bell clapper deformity. Now, ideally, the, the um, Da, 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 da. The testes should have a, a, a longitudinal lie um, and should be surrounded by the tunica vaginalis like this, attached um, posterior laterally um, through the gubernaculum. However, if the testicle has a transverse lie, it often leads to issues with attachment as well as increased mobility to rotate. And that rotation often pre puts you at a much higher risk of testicular torsion. Now, how does this present? It presents with acute pain that's typically localized to the testes, but can present in the lower abdomen. And it's a really important differential to consider when a young male comes in with any pathology of the lower abdomen, whether you may be thinking appendicitis um, or something else, always, always rule out testicular torsion. They can also report a history of similar past pain, and about 8% of people who present with a torsion have had a previous history of some form of a torsion that might have detorted previously, but now isn't able to do that. On examination, the testes are going to be tender, um, edematous, and you're also going to have an absent cremasteric reflex. Now, this reflex is really important to elicit because 95 patients, 95% of patients with um, 
torsion actually lack this reflex. It's a, so it's a really good initial test you can do. Time is testable when it comes to these, and therefore making a clinical diagnosis is super, super important. Even if you don't have imaging, you can go off your clinical reasoning to come to a diagnosis. You don't always have to have imaging to confirm it. If you're uncertain, you can always do a Doppler ultrasound, and that would reveal, again, edema as well as decreased intratesticular blood flow, emphasis being on the intratesticular bit. You can, off, you can as we mentioned, get venous compression around the testicle, so you can have increased blood flow around the testicle, but it's the intratesticular blood flow that we're looking at. In terms of management, detorsion, sorry, detorsion is absolutely critical, and you can either do this manually or surgically. About two-thirds of cases tend to detort medially, and one-third tend to detort laterally. If you can't do this, you can often move to a surgical approach, um, and you also do an orchidoplexy where you fixate actually the testes to the tunica vaginalis to prevent further torsions. And a detorting within 60 hours leads to 100% viability of the testes with no damage long term. Oh, sorry. Um, if you do that between 12 to 24 hours, 20%, and after 24%, 24 hours, it's almost a 0% viability. So you don't have any kind of testicular viability after 24 hours. So as you can see, really, really important. Uh, next, we have torsion of the testicular appendix or the appendix testis. It presents quite similarly. Often the pain is not as severe um, and they still may have um, an intact cremistrate reflex. So this is what the appendix testis looks like. And if this rotates on its own, as you can imagine, this is not going to be fixed anywhere, right? Because there's no gubernatulum for the appendix testis. Um, and therefore, it can rotate quite freely. And this would present with a torsion. Um, typically, this pain tends to be less kind of localized and more referred to the lower abdomen. Peak age is prepubertal. And they can present with a blue dot sign. And the blue dot sign is just a sign of the gangrenous appendix. Next, we have epididymitis or epididymoarchitis. Um, and... So this is it's about epididymitis and then talk about the orchitis side of things. So this is just infl inflammation of the epididymis. Uh, typically, it has a subacute onset um, in terms of pain and swelling, and the testes themselves tend to be anatomically normal. You can have systemic inflammation, and most patients with, about 95% of patients with epididymitis tend to have an increased white cell or CRP level. So that's a good initial test you can order. And quite commonly, the scrotum has overlying erythema and edema with an intact chromosteric reflex. You can often also have concurrent urinary complaints like discharge and dysuria, which isn't necessarily a consequence of the epididymal inflammation, but more so an indication of where the infection might have come from. Um, as the leading cause of epididymitis is actually STIs, so chlamydia, gonorrhea, E. coli. Young males can also present after a viral infection, so post-viral epididymitis, where it's more so an inflammatory change rather than a natural infective change. And the treatment is always going to be conservative and treating the underlying condition. So in most cases, antibiotic therapy for their STIs. Next, we have orchitis. And orchitis is inflammation of the testis. Um, it tends to be quite similar to epididymitis in its presentation, but usually more severe. You can have orchitis being a complication of epididymitis, but also you can have hematogenous or post-viral infections as well, post-viral inflammation. You can also have a combination of both epididymitis and orchitis. This would be called epididymoorchitis, I think relatively straightforward. And features of this include swelling, pain, nausea, vomiting, as well as signs of systemic infection. Next, we have hydrocele. So as I talked about earlier, this space, so this space is meant to be a collapsed space. As you can see here, you see how this is nice and closed up. That's how it's meant to be all the way down. And this initially was an open passage. So this was the processus vaginalis that should have closed into the tunica vaginalis. If you have a tunica vaginalis that is patent, which means that this connection is still intact, that can lead to a few conditions. So we can firstly have a communicating hydrocele where there's a communication 
between the abdominal cavity and the anterior cava vaginalis, and that can lead to the free flow of fluid in between. But then you can also have a normal kind of anatomy where you have the processus vaginalis, which is closed, but then the tunica vaginalis now has fluid in it. And this fluid obviously would not have come from up above here. It would have come usually from the testes, which is why the, the two broad types of hydrocele's, uh, did, did I say orchitis? No, sorry, I should have been saying hydrocele's all along. Um, so if you have a hydrocele that is due to a patent processus vaginalis, it often presents more chronically. It often is worse after prolonged periods of standing. And as you can imagine, it's based on gravity. Um, and then if you have normal anatomy with a processus vaginalis um, and a normal tunica vaginalis, but somehow you've ended up with fluid here or hydro meaning fluid, it is most likely to be a reactive edematous reaction to inflammation in the testes. So secondary to things like epididymorchitis or torsion. So those are your two types, a communicating versus non-communicating. And you would see positive transillumination because transillumination just means that you can kind of see it light up when you pass a light through it. And that is either going to be a cyst or a hydrocele. As you can imagine, if the fluid accumulation is secondary to something like a hydrocele, we would do something like a epididymorchitis, then we simply would not treat it as aggressively. Definitely no surgical management because there's nothing to surgically fix. But if there is a communicating hydrocele, we might want to fix that surgically. Next, we have a varicocele, which is a dilate, which is because of dilations and torsions of the pampaniform plexus in the spermatic cord. So that's the venous plexus that's draining blood back. It tends to occur more so on the left side because of two reasons. Firstly, you have a more acute venous drainage angle, and you also have direct draining, direct drainage into the IVC. You can also have this condition called nut nutcracker syndrome, where we have the superior mesenteric artery or the SMA compressing on a normal vein. And this normal vein, as you can imagine, would then a compression of this not of this uh, of the left renal vein, um, along with the entire um, venous drainage of the test of the left testes is going to result in backflow and pressure buildup and subsequently a varicele. The buzzword is a bag of worm appearance. This is kind of what it looks like. And 20% of adults and males actually have this. It's often asymptomatic, but can present with dull pain or a sensation of fullness. And some cases, if untreated, can have issues with fertility. Next, we have spermatoceles and epididymal cysts. Now, these are super, super conditions, super, super common conditions. Um, about a third of males have a cyst. So this is basically a, a completely benign condition where you have a painless sperm-containing cyst, which can either be in the testis or it can be in the epididymis. If it's in the epididymis, it's just called an epididymal cyst. Um, and you can clearly distinguish its bone boundaries from the testes. And this is important because when we have a mass, our first question is, is this a cancer? If it's it should be transilluminable because as I mentioned, it's fluid containing. Anything that's fluid containing should be transilluminable. And again, your two main things are your hydrocele's and your uh, cysts. This does not affect fertility and should only be treated if it's actually big enough to the point where it's causing pain and compression. Next, we have can testicular cancer. It's the most common solid tumor in 15 to 30 year old males and presents with a rapidly growing, rapid re, rapidly growing painless mass. Most commonly, these tend to be of a germ cell origin and if untreated can cause hemorrhage and infarction locally and then systematic spread as well. They do not transilluminate since it's a solid mass and is not a fluid filled space. And the initial investigation of choice is always going to be an ultrasound. Um, and here is kind of a diagram representing some of those changes that you can see. So epididymitis, you see a varicocele, a hydrocele, which is fluid filled, orchitis, inflammation of the testes, and the epididymal cyst we already talked about. And here's kind of a, a few things you can, um, a few things you can kind of, I was going to say look for, but then I also read how it says tall man. Um, <laughs> don't look for tall men. 
Um, I guess these are just risk factors and it's a pamphlet taken from um, one of the testicular cancer help groups, which talk about this detection and prevention. Um, so yes, check for masses. If you have a dull ache, enlargement of breasts is a big one because you can have issues with the testosterone, estrogen to testosterone ratio, heavy feeling of the scrotum, pain, back pain, um, and undescended testis as well, because testes that are undescended or descend data have a very, very high risk of malignant transformation. Um, next, again, I started this lecture by talking a bit about having a differential list for scrotal swellings. So here's kind of a really good one you can use when it comes to pain versus pain, painful versus painless. So things like torsion, infections, and trauma are all going to be painful. And hydrocele's, varicocele's, cysts in general, um, and tumors tend to be painless. And here's again just a graphical representation of those different causes that we talked about. And I think that is it. That is all we had today. Thank you all for coming in. As always. If you have any questions, send me an email or add me on Facebook. I'm more than happy to always answer them. Um, and as always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.